Section seventeen of Revenge by Robert Barr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section seventeen. A dramatic point. In the bad days of Balmaceda, when Chile was rent in twain and its capital was practically a besieged city, two actors walked together along the chief street of the place towards the one theatre that was then open. They belonged to a French dramatic company that would gladly have left Chile if it could, but being compelled by the stress of war to remain, the company did the next best thing, and gave performances at the principal theatre on such nights as a paying audience came. A stranger would hardly have suspected, by the look of the streets, that a deadly war was going on, and that the rebels, so called, were almost at the city gates. Although business was ruined, credit dead, and no man's life or liberty safe, the streets were filled with a crowd that seemed bent on enjoyment and making the best of things. As Jacques Dupré and Carlos Lemoine walked together, they conversed earnestly, not of the real war so close to their doors, but of the mimic conflicts of the stage. Monsieur Dupré was the leading man of the company, and he listened with the amused tolerance of an elder man to the energetic vehemence of the younger. "'You are all wrong, Dupré,' cried Lemoine. "'All wrong. I have studied the subject. Remember, I am saying nothing against your acting in general. You know you have no greater admirer than I am and that is something to say when the members of a dramatic company are usually at loggerheads through jealousy. Speak for yourself, Lemoine. You know I am green with jealousy of you. You are the rising star, and I am setting. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, Carl, my boy. That's nonsense, Dupre. I wish you would consider this seriously. It is because you are so good on the stage that I can't bear to see you false to your art, just to please the gallery. You should be above all that. How can a man be above his gallery, the highest spot in the house? Talk sense, Carlos, and then I'll listen. Yes, you're flippant, simply because you know you're wrong, and dare not argue this matter soberly. Now, she stabs you through the heart. No. False premises entirely. She says something about my wicked heart, and evidently intends to pierce that depraved organ, but a woman never hits what she aims at, and I deny that I'm ever stabbed through the heart. Say in the region or the neighborhood of the heart, and go on with your talk. Very well. She stabs you in a spot so vital that you die in a few minutes. You throw up your hands, you stagger against the mantel shelf, you tear open your collar and then grope at nothing, you press your hands on your wound and take two reeling steps forward, you call feebly for help and stumble against the sofa which you fall upon, and finally, still groping wildly, you roll off on the floor, where you kick out once or twice, your clinched hand comes with a thud on the boards, and all is over. Admirably described, Carlos. Lord, I wish my audience paid such attention to my efforts as you do. Now you claim this is all wrong, do you? All wrong. Suppose she stabbed you, what would you do? I would plunge forward on my face, dead. Great heavens! What would become of your curtain? Oh, hang the curtain! It's all very well for you to maledict the curtain, Carl, but you must work up to it. Your curtain would come down, and your friends in the gallery wouldn't know what had happened. Now I go through the evolutions you so graphically describe, and the audience gets time to take in the situation. They say, chuckling to themselves, 
that villain's got his dose at last and serve him right too they want to enjoy his struggles while the heroine stands grimly at the door taking care that he doesn't get away then when my fist comes down flop on the stage and they realize that i am indeed done for the yell of triumph that goes up is something delicious to hear that's just the point dupre i claim the actor has no right to hear applause that he should not know there is such a thing as an audience his business is to portray life exactly as it is you can't portray life in a death scene carl dupre i lose all patience with you or rather i would did i not know that you are much deeper than you would have us suppose you apparently won't see that i am very much in earnest about this of course you are my boy and that is one reason why you will become a very great actor i was ambitious myself once but as we grow older dupre shrugged his shoulders well we begin to have an eye on box office receipts i think you sometimes forget that i am a good deal older than you are you mean i am a fool and that i may learn wisdom with age i quite admit you are a better actor than i am in fact i said so only a moment ago but you wrong me brutus i said an elder soldier not a better but i will take you on your own ground have you ever seen a man stabbed or shot through the heart i never have but i know mighty well he wouldn't undo his necktie afterwards dupre threw back his head and laughed who is flippant now he asked i don't undo my necktie i merely tear off my collar which a dying man may surely be permitted to do but until you have seen a man die from such a stab as i receive every night i don't understand how you can justly find fault with my rendition of the tragedy i imagine you know that the truth lies between the two extremes the man done to death would likely not make such a fuss as i make nor would he depart so quickly as you say he would without giving the gallery gods a show for their money but here we are at the theater carlos and this acrimonious debate is closed until we take our next walk together in front of the theater soldiers were on duty marching up and down with muskets on their shoulders to show that the state was mighty and could take charge of a theater as well as conduct a war there were many loungers about which might have indicated to a person who did not know them that there would be a good house when the play began the two actors met the manager in the throng near the door how are the prospects tonight asked dupre very poor replied the manager not half a dozen seats have been sold then it isn't worth while beginning we must begin said the manager lowering his voice the president has ordered me not to close the theater oh hang the president cried lemoine impatiently why doesn't he put a stop to the war and then the theater would remain open of its own accord he is doing his best to put a stop to the war only his army does not carry out his orders as implicitly as our manager does said dupre smiling at the other's vehemence balmacida is a fool retorted the younger actor if he were out of the way the war would not last another day i believe he is playing a losing game anyhow it's a pity he hasn't to go to the front himself and then a stray bullet might find him and put an end to the war which would save the lives of many better men i say lemoine i wish you wouldn't talk like that expostulated the manager gently especially when there are so many listeners oh the larger my audience the better i like it 
rejoined Lemoine. I have all an actor's vanity in that respect. I say what I think, and I don't care who hears me. Yes, but you forget that we are, in a measure, guests of this country, and we should not abuse our hosts or the man who represents them. Ah, does he represent them? It seems to me you beg the whole question. That's just what the war is about. The general opinion is that Balmaceda misrepresents them, and that the country would be glad to be rid of him. That may all be, said the manager, almost in a whisper, for he was a man evidently inclined towards peace. But it does not rest with us to say so. We are French, and I think, therefore, it is better not to express an opinion. I'm not French, cried Lemoin. I'm a native Chilean, and I have a right to abuse my own country if I choose to do so. All the more reason, then, said the manager, looking timorously over his shoulder. All the more reason that you should be careful what you say. I suppose, said Dupre, by way of putting an end to the discussion, it is time for us to get our war paint on. Come along, Lemoine, and lecture me on our common art, and stop talking politics. If the nonsense you utter about Chile and its president is politics. The two actors entered the theater. They occupied the same dressing room, and the volatile Lemoine talked incessantly. Although there were but few people in the stalls, the gallery was well filled, as was usually the case. When going on for the last act in the final scene, Dupre whispered a word to the man who controlled the falling of the curtain, and when the actor, as the villain of the piece, received a fatal knife thrust from the ill-used heroine, he plunged forward on his face and died without a struggle to the amazement of the manager, who was watching the play from the front of the house, and to the evident bewilderment of the gallery, who had counted on an exciting struggle with death. Much as they desired the cutting off of the villain, they were not pleased to see him so suddenly shift his worlds without an agonizing realization of the fact that he was quitting an existence in which he had done nothing but evil. The curtain came down upon the climax, but there was no applause, and the audience silently filtered out into the street. There, said Dupre, when he returned to his dressing room, I hope you are satisfied now, Lemoine, and if you are, you are the only satisfied person in the house. I fell perfectly flat, as you suggested and you must have seen that the climax of the play fell flat also. Nevertheless, persisted Lemoine stoutly, it was the true rendering of the part. As they were talking, the manager came into their dressing room. Good heavens, Dupre, he said. Why did you end the piece in that idiotic way? What on earth got into you? the knife said dupre flippantly it went directly through her heart and lemoine here insists that when that happens a man should fall dead instantly i did it to please lemoine but you spoiled your curtain protested the manager yes i knew that would happen and i told lemoine so but he insists on art for art's sake you must expostulate with Lemoine, although I don't mind telling you both, frankly, that I don't intend to die in that way again. Well, I hope not, replied the manager. I don't want you to kill the play as well as yourself, you know, Dupre. Lemoine, whose face had by this time become restored to its normal appearance, retorted hotly, it all goes to show how we are surrounded and hampered by the traditions of the stage. The gallery wants to see a man die all over the place, and so the victim has to scatter the furniture about and make a fool of himself generally, 
when he should quietly succumb to a well-deserved blow. You ask any physician, and he will tell you that a man stabbed or shot through the heart collapses at once. There is no jumping back business in such a case. He doesn't play at leapfrog with the chairs and sofas, but sinks instantly to the floor and is done for. "'Come along, Lemoine,' cried Dupre, putting on his coat, "'and stop talking nonsense. True art consists of a judicious blending of the preconceived ideas of the gallery with the usual facts of the case. An instantaneous photograph of a trotting horse is doubtless technically and absolutely correct, yet it is not a true picture of the animal in motion. "'Then you admit,' said Lemoine quickly, that I am technically correct in what I state about the result of such a wound? I admit nothing, said Dupre. I don't believe you are correct in anything you say about the matter. I suppose the truth is that no two men die alike under the same circumstances. They do when the heart is touched. What absurd nonsense you talk! no two men act alike when the heart is touched in love why then should they when it is touched in death come along to the hotel and let us stop this idiotic discussion ah sighed lemoine you will throw your chances away you are too careless to pray you do not study enough this kind of thing is all very well and chilly but it will wreck your chances when you go to Paris. If you studied more deeply, Dupre, you would take Paris by storm. Thanks, said Dupre lightly, but unless the rebels take this city by storm, and that shortly, we may never see Paris again. To tell the truth, I have no heart for anything but the heroine's knife. I am sick and tired of the situation here." As Dupre spoke, they met a small squad of soldiers coming briskly towards the theatre. The man in charge evidently recognized them, for saying a word to his men they instantly surrounded the two actors. The sergeant touched Lemoine on the shoulder and said, "'It is my duty to arrest you, sir.' "'In heaven's name, why?' asked Lemoine. The man did not answer, but a soldier stepped to either side of Lemoine. "'Am I under arrest also?' asked Dupre. "'No.' "'By what authority do you arrest my friend?' inquired Dupre. "'By the President's order.' "'But where is your authority?' Where are your papers? Why is this arrest made?" The sergeant shook his head and said, "'We have the orders of the President, and that is sufficient for us. Stand back, please.' The next instant Dupre found himself alone, with the squad and their prisoner disappearing down a back street. For a moment he stood there as if dazed. Then he turned and ran as fast as he could back to the theatre again, hoping to meet a carriage for hire on the way. Arriving at the theatre, he found the lights out and the manager on the point of leaving. "'Lemoine has been arrested,' he cried, "'arrested by a squad of soldiers whom we met, and they said they acted by order of the President.' The manager seemed thunderstruck by the intelligence, and gazed helplessly at Dupre. "'What is the charge?' he said at last. "'That I do not know,' answered the actor. "'They simply said they were acting under the President's orders.' "'This is bad, as bad as can be,' said the manager, looking over his shoulder and speaking as if in fear. Lemoin has been talking recklessly. I never could get him to realize that he was in Chile, and that he must not be so free in his speech. He always insisted that this was the nineteenth century, 
and a man could say what he liked, as if the nineteenth century had anything to do with a South American republic. "'You don't imagine,' said Dupre, with a touch of pallor coming into his cheeks, "'that this is anything serious. It will mean nothing more than a day or two in prison, at the worst?' The manager shook his head, and said, "'We had better get a carriage and see the President as soon as possible. I'll undertake to send Lemoine back to Paris, or to put him on board one of the French ironclads. But there is no time to be lost. We can probably get a carriage in the square.' They found a carriage and drove as quickly as they could to the residence of the President. At first they were refused admittance, but finally they were allowed to wait in a small room while their message was taken to Balmaceda. An hour passed, but still no invitation came to them from the President. The manager sat silent in a corner while Dupre paced up and down the small room, torn with anxiety about his friend. At last an officer entered and presented them with the compliments of the president, who regretted that it was impossible for him to see them that night. The officer added, for their information, by order of the president, that Lemoine was to be shot at daybreak. He had been tried by court-martial and condemned to death for sedition. The president regretted having kept them waiting so long, but the court-martial had been sitting when they arrived, and the president thought that perhaps they would be interested in knowing the verdict. With that the officer escorted the two dumbfounded men to the door, where they got into their carriage without a word. The moment they were out of earshot, the manager said to the coachman, "'Drive as quickly as you can to the residence of the French minister.' Everyone at the French legation had retired when these two panic-stricken men reached there, but after a time the secretary consented to see them, and, on learning the seriousness of the case, he undertook to arouse His Excellency and learn if anything could be done. The minister entered the room shortly after and listened with interest to what they had to say. "'You have your carriage at the door?' he asked, when they had finished their recital. "'Yes.' "'Then I will take it and see the President at once. Perhaps you will wait here until I return.' Another hour dragged its slow length along, and they were well into the second hour before the rattle of wheels was heard in the silent street. The minister came in, and the two anxious men saw by his face that he had failed in his mission. "'I am sorry to say,' said His Excellency, "'that I have been unable even to get the execution postponed. I did not understand, when I undertook the mission, that M. Lemoine was a citizen of Chile. You see, that fact puts the matter entirely out of my hands. I am powerless.' I could only advise the President not to carry out his intentions, but he is tonight in a most unreasonable and excited mood, and I fear nothing can be done to save your friend. If he had been a citizen of France, of course this execution would not have been permitted to take place, but, as it is, it is not our affair. M. Lemoine seems to have been talking with some indiscretion. He does not deny it himself, nor does he deny his citizenship. If he had taken a conciliatory attitude at the court-martial, the result might not have been so disastrous, but it seems that he insulted the President to his face, and predicted that he would, within two weeks, meet him in Hades. The utmost I could do was to get the President to sign a permit for you to see your friend, if you present it at the prison before the execution takes place. I fear you have no time to lose. Here is the paper." Dupre took the document and thanked His Excellency for his exertions on their behalf. 
he realized that Lemoine had sealed his own fate by his independence and lack of tact. The two dejected men drove from the legation and through the deserted streets to the prison. They were shown through several stone-paved rooms to a stone-paved courtyard, and there they waited for some time until the prisoner was brought in between two soldiers. Lemoine had thrown off his coat and appeared in his shirt-sleeves. He was not manacled or bound in any way, there being too many prisoners for each one to be allowed the luxury of fetters. "'Ah!' cried Lemoine when he saw them. "'I knew you would come if that old scoundrel of a president would allow you in, of which I had my doubts. How did you manage it?' the french minister got us a permit said dupre oh you went to him did you of course he could do nothing for as i told you i have the misfortune to be a citizen of this country how comically life is made up of trivialities i remember once in paris going with a friend to take the oath of allegiance to the french republic and did you take it cried dupre eagerly alas no we met two other friends and we all adjourned to a cafe and had something to drink i little thought that bottle of champagne was going to cost me my life for of course if i had taken the oath of allegiance my friend the french minister would have bombarded the city before he would have allowed the execution to go on. "'Then you know to what you are condemned,' said the manager, with tears in his eyes. "'Oh, I know that Bomacita thinks he is going to have me shot, but then he always was a fool and never knew what he was talking about. I told him if he would allow you two in at the execution, and instead of having a whole squad to fire at me, order one expert marksman, if he had such a thing in his whole army, to shoot me through the heart, that I would show you, Dupre, how a man dies under such circumstances. But the villain refused. The usurper has no soul for art, or anything else, for that matter. I hope you won't mind my death. I assure you I don't mind it myself. I would much rather be shot than live in this confounded country any longer. But I have made up my mind to cheat old Bomacida, if I can. And I want you, Dupre, to pay particular attention and not to interfere." As Lemoine said this, he quickly snatched from the sheath at the soldier's side the bayonet which hung at his hip. The soldiers were standing one to the right and one to the left of him, with their hands interlaced over the muzzles of their guns, whose butts rested on the stone floor. They apparently paid no attention to the conversation that was going on, if they understood it, which was unlikely. Lemoine had the bayonet in his hands before either of the four men present knew what he was doing. Grasping both hands over the butt of the bayonet, with the point towards his breast, he thrust the blade with desperate energy nearly through his body. The whole action was done so quickly that no one realized what had happened until Lemoine threw his hands up and they saw the bayonet sticking in his breast. A look of agony came in the wounded man's eyes, and his lips whitened. He staggered against the soldier at his right, who gave way with the impact, and then he tottered against the whitewashed stone wall, his right arm sweeping automatically up and down the wall, as if he were brushing something from the stones. A groan escaped him, and he dropped on one knee. His eyes turned helplessly towards Dupre, and he gasped out the words, "'My God!' you were right after all then he fell forward on his face and the tragedy ended end of section 17
Section 18 of Revenge by Robert Barr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 18. Two Florentine Balconies. Prince Padima sat desolately on his lofty balcony at Florence and cursed things generally. Fate had indeed dealt hardly with the young man. The prince had been misled by the apparent reasonableness of the adage that if you want a thing well done, you should do it yourself. In committing a murder, it is always advisable to have someone else do it for you, but the prince's plans had been several times interfered with by the cowardice or inefficiency of his emissaries. So on one unfortunate occasion, he had determined to remove an objectionable man with his own hand, and realized then how easily mistakes may occur. He had met the man face to face under a corner lamp in Venice. The recognition was mutual, and the man, fearing his noble enemy, had fled. The prince pursued, and the man apparently tried to double upon him, and, with his cloak over his face, endeavored to sneak past along the dark wall. When the prince deftly ran the dagger into his vitals, he was surprised that the man made no resistance or outcry, made no effort to ward off the blow, but sunk lifeless at the prince's feet with a groan. Alarmed at this, the prince bade his servant drag the body to a spot where a votive lamp set in the wall threw dim yellow rays to the pavement. Then His Highness was appalled to see that he had assassinated a scion of one of the noblest families of Venice, which was a very different thing from murdering a man of low degree whose life the law took little note of. So the prince had to flee from Venice, and he took up his residence in a narrow street in an obscure part of Florence. Seldom had fate played a man so scurvy a trick, and the prince was fully justified in his cursing, for the unfortunate episode had interrupted a most absorbing amour, which, at that moment, was rapidly approaching an interesting climax. Prince Padima had been several weeks in Florence, and those weeks had been deadly dull. "'The women of Florence,' he said to himself bitterly, are not to be compared with those of Venice. But even if they had been, the necessity of keeping quiet, for a time at least, would have prevented the prince from taking advantage of his enforced sojourn in the fair city. On this particular evening, the prince's somber meditations were interrupted by a song. The song apparently came from the same building in which his suite of rooms were situated, and from an open window some distance below him. What caught his attention was the fact that the song was Venetian, and the voice that sang it was the rich mellow voice of Venice. There were other exiles then beside himself. He peered over the edge of the balcony perched like an eagle's nest high above the narrow stone street and endeavored to locate the open window from which the song came, or, better still, to catch a glimpse of the singer. For a time he was unsuccessful, but at last his patience was rewarded. On a balcony to the right, and some distance below his own, there appeared the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. The dark oval face was so distinctly Venetian that he almost persuaded himself he had met her in his native town. She stood with her hands on the top rail of the balcony, her dark hair tumbled in rich confusion over her shapely shoulders. The golden light in the evening sky touched her face with glory, as she looked towards it, of that part of it that could be seen at the end of the narrow street. The prince's heart beat high as he gazed upon the face that was unconscious of his scrutiny. Instantly the thought flashed over him that exile in Florence might, after all, have its compensations. "'Pietro!' 
he whispered softly through his own open windows to the servant who was moving silently about the room. "'Come here for a moment, quietly.' The servant came stealthily to the edge of the window. "'You see that girl on the lower balcony?' said the prince in a whisper. Pietro nodded. "'Find out for me who she is, why she is here, whether she has any friends. Do it silently so as to arouse no suspicion.' Again his faithful servant nodded and disappeared into the gloom of the room. Next day Pietro brought to his eager master what information he had been able to glean. He had succeeded in forming the acquaintance of the signorina's maid. For some reason, which the maid either did not know or would not disclose, the signorina was exiled for a time from Venice. She belonged to a good family there, but the name of the family the maid also refused to divulge. She dared not tell it, she said. They had been in Florence for several weeks, but had only taken the rooms below within the last two days. The signorina received absolutely no one, and the maid had been cautioned to say nothing whatever about her to any person but she had apparently succumbed in a measure to the blandishments of gallant Pietro. The rooms had been taken because of their quiet and obscure position. That evening the prince was again upon his balcony, but his thoughts were not so bitter as they had been the day before. He had a bouquet of beautiful flowers beside him. He listened for the Venetian song, but was disappointed at not hearing it and he hoped that Pietro had not been so injudicious as to arouse the suspicions of the maid, who might communicate them to her mistress. He held his breath eagerly as he heard the windows below open. The maid came out on the balcony and placed an easy chair in the corner of it. She deftly arranged the cushions and the drapery of it, and presently the signorina herself appeared and with languid grace seated herself. The prince had now a full view of her lovely face, as the girl rested her elbow on the railing of the balcony and her cheek upon her hand. "'You may go now, Pepita,' said the girl. The maid threw a lace shawl over the shoulders of her mistress and departed. The prince leaned over the balcony and whispered, Signorina. The startled girl looked up and down the street, and then at the balcony which stood out against the opalescent sky, the tracery of ironwork showing like delicate etching on the luminous background. She flushed and dropped her eyes, making no reply. Signorina, repeated the prince, I too am an exile. Pardon me, it is in remembrance of our lovely city and with that he lightly flung the bouquet which fell at her feet on the floor of the balcony. For a few moments the girl did not move nor raise her eyes. Then she cast a quick glance through the open window into her room. After some slight hesitation she stooped gracefully and picked up the bouquet. "'Ah, beautiful Venice!' she murmured with a sigh, still not looking upwards. The prince was delighted with the success of his first advance, which is always the difficult step. Evening after evening they sat there, later and later. The acquaintance ripened to its inevitable conclusion, the conclusion the prince had counted on from the first. One evening she stood in the darkness with her cheek pressed against the wall at the corner of her balcony nearest to him. He looked over and downward at her. "'It cannot be! It cannot be!' she said, with a frightened quaver in her voice, but a quaver which the prince recognized, with his large experience, as the tone of yielding. "'It must be!' he whispered down to her. "'It was ordained from the first. It has to be!' 
the girl was weeping silently. "'It is impossible,' she said at last. "'My servant sleeps outside my door. Even if she did not know, your servant would, and there would be gossip and scandal. It is impossible.' "'Nothing is impossible,' cried the prince eagerly, "'where true love exists. I shall lock my door, and Pietro shall know nothing about it. He never comes unless I call him. I will get a rope and throw it to your balcony. Lock you your door as I do mine. In the darkness nothing is seen. No, no, she murmured. That would not do. You could not climb back again, and all would be lost. Oh, nonsense, cried the young man eagerly. It is nothing to climb back. He was about to add that he had done it frequently before, but he checked himself in time. For a moment she was silent. Then she said, "'I cannot risk your not getting back. It must be certain. If you get a rope, a strong rope, and put a loop in it for your foot, and pass the other end of the rope to me around the staunchest railing of your balcony, I will let you down to the level of my own. Then you can easily swing yourself within reach. If you find you cannot climb back, I can help you by pulling on the rope, and you will ascend as you came down." The prince laughed lightly. "'Do you think,' he said, "'that your frail hands are stronger than mine?' Four hands,' she replied, "'are stronger than two. Besides, I am not so weak as, perhaps, you think. Very well, he replied, not in a mood to cavil about trivialities. When shall it be? Tonight? No, tomorrow night. You must get your rope tomorrow. Again the prince laughed quietly. I have the rope in my room now, he answered. You were very sure, she said softly. No, not sure. I was strong in hope. Is your door locked? Yes, she replied in an agitated whisper. But it is still early. Wait an hour or two. Ah, cried the prince, it will never be darker than at this moment. And think, my darling, how long I have waited. There was no reply. "'Stand inside the window,' whispered the prince. As she did so, a coil of rope fell on the balcony. "'Have you got it?' he asked. "'Yes,' was the scarcely audible reply. "'Then don't trust to your own strength. Give it a turn around the balcony rail.' "'I have done so,' she whispered. Although he could not see her because of the darkness, she saw him silhouetted against the night sky. He tested the loop, putting his foot in it and pulling at the rope with both hands. Then he put the rope around the corner support of the balcony. "'Are you sure the rope is strong enough?' she asked. "'Who bought it?' "'Pietro got it for me. It is strong enough to hold ten men. His foot was in the loop, and he slung himself from his balcony, holding the rope with both hands. Let it go very gently, he said. I will tell you when you have lowered enough. Holding the end of the rope firmly, the girl let it out inch by inch. That is enough, the prince said at last and she held him where he was, leaning over the balcony towards him. "'Prince Padima, she said to him. "'Ah!' cried the man with a start. "'How did you learn my name?' "'I have long known it. It is a name of sorrow to our family.' "'Prince,' she continued, 
have you never seen anything in my face that brought recollection to you or is the memory so short that the grief you bring to others leaves no trace on your own mind god cried the prince in alarm seizing the rope above him as if to climb back what do you mean the girl loosened the rope for an inch or two and the prince was lowered with a sickening feeling in his heart as he realized his position a hundred feet above the stone street i can see you plainly said the girl in hard and husky tones if you make an attempt to climb to your balcony i will at once loosen the rope is it possible you have not suspected who i am and why i am here the prince was dizzy he had whirled gently around in one direction for some time but now the motion ceased and he began to revolve with equal gentleness in the other direction like the body of a man who is hanged a sharp memory pierced his brain mila is dead he cried with a gasp in his breath she was drowned you are flesh and blood tell me you are not her spirit i cannot tell you that answered the girl my own spirit seemed to leave me when the body of my sister was brought from the canal at the foot of our garden you know the place well you know the gate and the steps i think her spirit then took the place of my own ever since that day i have lived only for revenge and now prince padima the hour i have waited for is come an agonizing cry for help rang through the silent street but there was no answer to the call it is useless said the girl calmly it will be accounted an accident your servant bought the rope that will be found with you anyone who knows you will have an explanation ready for what has happened no one will suspect me and i want you to know that your death will be unavenged prince though you are you are a demon he cried she watched him silently as he stealthily climbed up the rope he did not appear sufficiently to realize how visible his body was against the still luminous sky when he was within a foot of his balcony she loosened the rope and again he sunk to where he had been before and hung there exhausted by his futile effort i will marry you he said if you will let me reach my balcony again i will upon my honor you shall be a princess she laughed lightly we venetians never forget nor forgive prince padima good-bye she sunk fainting in her chair as she let go the rope and clapped her hands to her ears so that no sound came up from the stone street below when she staggered into her room all was silence end of section eighteen section nineteen of revenge by robert barr this librivox recording is in the public domain Section 19. The Exposure of Lord Stansford The large mansion of Louis Heckel, millionaire and dealer in gold mines, was illuminated from top to bottom. Carriages were arriving and departing, and guests were hurrying up the carpeted stair after passing under the canopy that stretched from the doorway to the edge of the street. A crowd of onlookers stood on the pavement watching the arrival of ladies so charmingly attired. Lord Stansford came alone in a hansom, and he walked quickly across the bit of carpet stretched to the roadway, and then more leisurely up the broad stair. He was an athletic young fellow of twenty-six or thereabout. The moment he entered the large reception room his eyes wandered, searchingly over the gallant company apparently looking for someone whom he could not find he passed into a further room 
and through that into a third, and there his searching gaze met the stare of Billy Heckle. Heckle was a young man of about the same age as Lord Stansford, and he also was seemingly on the lookout for someone among the arriving guests. The moment he saw Lord Stansford, a slight frown gathered upon his brow, and he moved among the throng toward the spot where the other stood. Stansford saw him coming, and did not seem to be so pleased as might have been expected, but he made no motion to avoid the young man, who accosted him without salutation. "'Look here,' said Heckle, gruffly. "'I want a word with you.' "'Very well,' answered Stansford, in a low voice. "'So long as you speak in tones no one else can hear, I am willing to listen.' "'You will listen whether or no,' replied the other, who, nevertheless, took the hint and subdued his voice. "'I have met you on various occasions lately, and I want to give you a word of warning. You seem to be very devoted to Miss Linderham, so perhaps you do not know she is engaged to me.' "'I have heard it so stated,' said Lord Stansford but I have found some difficulty in believing the statement. "'Now see here,' cried the horsey young man. "'I want none of your cheek, and I give you fair warning that if you pay any more attention to the young lady I shall expose you in public. I mean what I say, and I am not going to stand any of your nonsense.' Lord Stansford's face grew pale, and he glanced about him to see if by chance anyone had overheard the remark. He seemed about to resent it, but finally gained control over himself, and said, "'We are in your father's house, Mr. Heckle, and I suppose it is quite safe to address a remark like that to me.' "'I know it's quite safe, anywhere,' replied Heckle. You've got the straight tip from me. Now see you pay attention to it." Heckle turned away, and Lord Stansford, after standing there for a moment, wandered back to the middle room. The conversation had taken place somewhat near a heavily curtained window, and the two men stood slightly apart from the other guests. When they left the spot, the curtains were drawn gently apart and a tall, very handsome young lady stepped from between them. She watched Lord Stansford's retreat for a moment, and then made as though she would follow him, but one of her admirers came forward to claim her hand for the first dance. "'Music has just begun in the ballroom,' he said. She placed her hand on the arm of her partner and went out with him. When the dance was over, she was amazed to see Lord Stansford still in the room. She had expected him to leave when the son of his host spoke so insultingly to him, but the young man had not departed. He appeared to be enjoying himself immensely, and danced through every dance with the utmost devotion, which rather put to shame many of the young men who lounged against the walls. Never once, however, did he come near Miss Linderham, until the evening was well on, and then he passed her by accident. She touched him on the arm with her fan, and he looked round quickly. "'Oh, how do you do, Miss Linderham?' he said. "'Why have you ignored me all the evening?' she asked, looking at him with sparkling eyes. "'I haven't ignored you.' he replied with some embarrassment. I did not know you were here. Oh, that is worse than ignoring, replied Miss Linderham with a laugh. But now that you do know I am here, I wish you to take me into the garden. It is becoming insufferably hot in here. Yes, said the young man, getting red in the face. It is warm. The girl could not help noticing his reluctance, but nevertheless she took his arm, and they passed through several rooms to the terrace, which faced the garden. 
Lord Stansford's anxious eyes again seemed to search the rooms through which they had passed, and again on encountering those of Billy Heckle, Miss Lindrum's escort shivered slightly as he passed on. The girl wondered what mystery was at the bottom of all this, and with feminine curiosity resolved to find out, even if she had to ask Lord Stansford himself. They sauntered along one of the walks until they reached a seat far from the house. The music floated out to them through the open windows, faint in the distance. Miss Linderham sat down and motioned Lord Stansford to sit beside her. "'Now,' she said, turning her handsome face full upon him, "'why have you avoided me all the evening?' "'I haven't avoided you.' he said. "'Tut, tut, you mustn't contradict a lady, you know. I want the reason, the real reason, and no excuses.' Before the young man could reply, Billy Heckle, his face flushed with wine or anger, or perhaps both, strode down the path and confronted them. "'I gave you your warning,' he cried. Lord Stansford sprang to his feet. Miss Linderham arose also, and looked in some alarm from one young man to the other. "'Stop a moment, Heckle. Don't say a word, and I will meet you where you like afterwards,' hurriedly put in his lordship. "'Afterwards is no good to me,' answered Heckle. "'I gave you the tip, and you haven't followed it.' "'I beg you to remember,' said Stansford in a low voice with a tremor in it. There is a lady present. Miss Linderham turned to go. Stop a moment, cried Heckle. Do you know who this man is? Miss Linderham stopped, but did not answer. I'll tell you who he is. He is a hired guest. My father pays five guineas for his presence here tonight. And every place you have met him, he has been there on hire. That's the kind of man Lord Stansford is. I told you I should expose you. Now I am going to tell the others. Lord Stansford's face was as white as paper. His teeth were clinched, and taking one quick step forward, he smote Heckle fair between the two eyes and felled him to the ground. "'You cur!' he cried. "'Get up, or I shall kick you, and hate myself ever after for doing it.' Young Heckle picked himself up, cursing under his breath. "'I'll settle with you, my man,' he cried. "'I'll get a policeman. You'll spend the remainder of this night in the cells.' "'I shall do nothing of the sort,' answered Lord Stansford catching him by both wrists with an iron grasp. "'Now pay attention to me, Billy Heckle. You feel my grip on your wrist. You felt my blow on your face, didn't you? Now you go into the house by whatever back entrance there is, go to your room, wash the blood off your face, and stay there. Otherwise, by God, I'll break both of your wrists as you stand here.' and he gave the wrists a wrench that made the other wince, big and bulky as he was. "'I promise,' said Heckle. "'Very well. See that you keep your promise.' Young Heckle slunk away, and Lord Stansford turned to Miss Linderham, who stood looking on, speechless with horror and surprise. "'What a brute you are!' she cried her under lip quivering. Yes, he replied quietly. Most of us men are brutes when you take a little of the varnish off. Won't you sit down, Miss Linderham? There is no need now to reply to the question you asked me. The incident you have witnessed, and what you have heard, has been its answer. The young lady did not sit down. She stood looking at him, her eyes softening a trifle. "'Is it true, then?' she cried. "'Is what true?' 
that you are here as a hired guest yes it is true then why did you knock him down if it was the truth because he spoke the truth before you i hope lord stansford you don't mean to imply that i am in any way responsible for your ruffianism you are and in more than one sense of the word that young fellow threatened me when i came here tonight knowing that i was his father's hired guest i did not wish exposure and so i avoided you you spoke to me and asked me to bring you out here i came knowing that if heckle saw me he would carry out his threat he has carried it out and i have had the pleasure of knocking him down miss linderham sank upon the seat and once more motioned with her fan for him to take the place beside her then you receive five guineas a night for appearing at the different places where i have met you as a matter of fact said stansford i only get two guineas i suppose the other three if such is the price paid goes to my employers i thought mr heckle was your employer tonight i mean to the company who let me out if i make myself clear spink and company telephone one zero zero eight zero three if you should ever want an eligible guest for any entertainment you give and men are scarce you have only to telephone them and they will send me to you oh i see said miss lindrum tapping her knee with the fan it is only justice to my fellow employees continued lord stansford to say that i believe they are all eligible young men but many of them may be had for a guinea the charge in my case is higher as i have a title i have tried to flatter myself that it was my polished dignified manner that won me the extra remuneration but after your exclamation on my brutality tonight i am afraid i must fall back on my title we members of the aristocracy come high you know there was silence between them for a few moments and then the girl looked up at him and said aren't you ashamed of your profession lord stansford yes replied lord stansford i am then why do you follow it why does a man sweep a street crossing lack of money one must have money you know to get along in this world and i alas have none i had a little once i wanted to make it more so gambled and lost i laid low for a couple of years and saw none of my old acquaintances but it was no use there was nothing i could turn my hand to this profession as you call it led me back into my old set again it is true that many of the houses i frequented before my disaster overtook me do not hire guests i am more in demand by the new rich like heckle here who with his precious son does not know how to treat a guest even when that guest is hired but i should think said miss linderham that a man like you would go to south africa or australia where there are great things to be done i imagine from the insight i have had into your character you would make a good fighter why don't you go where fighting is appreciated and where they do not call a policeman i have often thought of it miss linderham but you see to secure an appointment one needs to have a certain amount of influence and be able to pass examinations i can't pass an examination in anything i have quarreled with all my people and have no influence to tell you the truth i am saving up money now in the hope of being able to buy an outfit to go to the cape you would much rather be in london though i suppose yes if i had a reasonably good income 
Are you open to a fair offer? Uh, what do you mean by a fair offer? I mean, would you entertain a proposal in your present line of business with increased remuneration? The young man sat silent for a few moments and did not look at his companion. When he spoke, there was a shade of resentment in his voice. I thought you saw, Miss Linderham, that I was not very proud of my present occupation. No, but as you said, a man will do anything for money. I beg your pardon for again contradicting you, but I never said anything of the sort. I thought you did, when you were speaking of the crossing sweeping. But never mind. I know a lady who has plenty of money. She is an artist. At least, she thinks she is one, and wishes to devote her life to art. She is continually pestered by offers of marriage, and she knows these offers come to her largely because of her money. Now, this lady wishes to marry a man, and will settle upon him two thousand pounds a year. Would you be willing to accept that offer if I got you an introduction? It would depend very much on the lady, said Stansford. Oh, no, it wouldn't for you would have nothing whatever to do with her, except that you would be her hired husband. She wants to devote herself to painting, not to you. Don't you understand? And so long as you did not trouble her, you could enjoy your two thousand pounds a year. You, perhaps, might have to appear at some of the receptions she would give, and I have no doubt she would add five guineas an evening for your presence. That would be an extra, you know. There was a long silence between them after Maggie Linderham ceased speaking. The young man kicked the gravel with his toes, and his eyes were bent upon the path before him. He is thinking it over, said Miss Linderham to herself. At last, Lord Stansford looked up with a sigh. Did you see the late scuffle between the unfortunate Heckle and myself? Did I see it? she asked. How could I help seeing it? Ah, then, did you notice that when he was down I helped him up? Yes, and threatened to break his wrists when you got him up. Quite so. I should have done it, too, if he had not promised. But what I wanted to call your attention to was the fact that he was standing up when I struck him, and I want also to impress upon you the other fact that I did not hit him when he was down. Did you notice that? Of course I noticed it. No man would hit another man when he was down. I am very glad, Miss Linderham, that you recognize it as a code of honor with us men brutes as we are. Don't you think a woman should be equally generous? Certainly, but I don't see what you mean. I mean this, Miss Linderham, that your offer is hitting me when I'm down. Oh, exclaimed Miss Linderham, in dismay. I'm sure I beg your pardon. I did not look at it in that light. Oh, it doesn't matter very much said Stansford, rising. It's all included in the two guineas, but I'm pleased to think I have some self-respect left, and that I can refuse your lady, and will not become a hired husband at two thousand pounds a year. May I see you back to the house, Miss Linderham? As you are well aware, I have duties towards other guests who are not hired, and it is a point of honor with me to earn my money. I wouldn't like a complaint to reach the ears of Spink and Company. Miss Linderham rose and placed her hand within his arm. Telephone what number? she asked. Telephone 100803, he answered. I am sorry the firm did not provide me with some of their cards when I was at the office this afternoon. 
"'It doesn't matter,' said Miss Linderham. "'I will remember.' And they entered the house together. Next day, at a large studio in Kensington, none of the friends who had met Miss Linderham at the ball the evening before would have recognized the girl. Not but what she was as pretty as ever, perhaps a little prettier, with her long white pinafore and her pretty fingers discolored by the crayons she was using. She was trying to sketch upon the canvas before her the figure of a man striking out from the shoulder, and she did not seem to have much success with her drawing, perhaps because she had no model, and perhaps because her mind was preoccupied. She would sit for a long time staring at the canvas, then jump up and put in lines which did not appear to bring the rough sketch any nearer perfection. The room was large with a good north window, and scattered about were the numberless objects that go to the confusing makeup of an artist's workshop. At last Miss Linderham threw down her crayon, went to the end of the room where a telephone hung, and rang the bell. "'Give me,' she said, "'one zero zero eight zero three. After a few moments of waiting, a voice came. "'Is that Spank and Company?' she asked. "'Yes, madam,' was the reply. "'You have in your employ Lord Stansford, I think?' "'Yes, madam.' "'Is he engaged for this afternoon?' "'No, madam.' "'Well, send him to Miss Linderham, number 2044, Cromwell Road, South Kensington.' The man at the other end wrote the address, and then asked, "'At what hour, madam?' "'I want him from four till six o'clock.' "'Very well, madam. We shall send him.' "'Now,' said Miss Linderham, with a sigh of relief, I can have a model who will strike the right attitude. It is so difficult to draw from memory. The reason why so many women fail as artists, as well as in many other professions, may be because they pay so much attention to their own dress. It is an astonishing fact to record that Miss Linderham sent out for a French hairdresser, who was a most expensive man and whom she generally called in only when some very important function was about to take place. "'I want you,' she said, "'to dress my hair in an artistic way, and yet in a manner that it will seem as if no particular trouble had been taken. Do you understand me?' "'Ah, perfectly, mademoiselle,' said the polite Frenchman. "'You shall be so fascinating, mademoiselle, that—' "'Yes,' said Miss Linderham. "'That is what I want.' At three o'clock she had on a dainty gown. The sleeves were turned up as if she were ready for the most serious work. The spotless pinafore which covered this dress had the most fetching little frill around it. All in all, it was doubtful if any studio in London, even one belonging to the most celebrated painter, had in it as pretty a picture as Miss Maggie Linderham was that afternoon. At three o'clock there came a ring at the telephone, and when Miss Linderham answered the call, the voice which she had heard before said, "'I am very sorry to disappoint you, madam, but Lord Stansford resigned this afternoon. We could send you another man if you like to have him.' "'No, no!' cried Miss Linderham, and the man at the other end of the telephone actually thought she was weeping. "'No, I don't want anyone else. It doesn't really matter.' "'The other man,' replied the voice, "'would be only two guineas, and it was five for Lord Stansford. We could send you a man for a guinea, although we don't recommend him.' "'No,' said Miss Linderham, "'I don't want anybody.' I am glad Lorne Stansford is not coming, as the little party I propose to give has been postponed. Ah, then, when it does come off, madam, I hope—' But Miss Linderham hung up the receiver, 
and did not listen to the recommendations the man was sending over the wire about his hired guests. The chances are that Maggie Linderham would have cried had it not been that her hair was so nicely yet carelessly done. But before she had time to make up her mind what to do, the trim little maid came along the gallery and down the steps into the studio, with a little silver salver in her hand, and on it a card which she handed to Miss Linderham, who picked up the card and read, Richard Stansford. Oh, she cried joyfully, ask him to come here. Won't you see him in the drawing room, miss? No, no, tell him I am very busy and bring him to the studio. The maid went up the stair again. Miss Linderham, taking one long careful glance at herself, looking over her shoulder in the tall mirror, and not caring to touch her wealth of hair, picked up her crayon and began making the sketch of the striking man even worse than it was before. She did not look round until she heard Lorne Stansford's step on the stair. Then she gave an exclamation of surprise on seeing him. The young man was dressed in a wide-awake hat, and the costume which we see in the illustrated papers as picturing our friends in South Africa. All he needed was a belt of cartridges and a rifle to make the picture complete. This is hardly the dress a man is supposed to wear in London when he makes an afternoon call on a lady, Miss Linderham, said the young man with a laugh. But I had either to come this way or not at all, for my time is very limited. I thought it was too bad to leave the country without giving you an opportunity to apologize for your conduct last night and for the additional insult of hiring me for two hours this afternoon. And so, you see, I came. "'I am very glad you did,' replied Miss Linderham. "'I was much disappointed when they telephoned me this afternoon that you had resigned. I must say that you look exceedingly well in that outfit, Lord Stansford.' "'Yes,' said the young man, casting a glance over himself. "'I am compelled to admit that it is rather becoming.' I have had the pleasure of attracting a good deal of attention as I came along the street. They took you for a cowboy, I suppose? Well, something of that sort. The small boy, I regret to say, was so unfeeling as to sing, He's got him on, and other ribald ditties of that kind which they seemed to think suited the occasion. But others looked at me with great respect which compensated for the disadvantages. Will you pardon the rudeness of a pioneer, Miss Linderham, when I say that you look even more charming in the studio dress than you did in ball costume? And I never thought that could be possible. Oh, cried the girl, flushing, perhaps because the crimson paint on the palette she had picked up reflected on her cheek. You must excuse this working garb, as I did not expect visitors. You see, they telephoned me that you were not coming. The deluded young man actually thought this statement was correct, which in part it was, and he believed also that the luxuriant hair tossed up here and there with seeming carelessness was not the result of an art far superior to any the girl herself had ever put upon canvas. "'So you are off to South Africa?' she said. "'Yes, the Cape.' "'Oh, is the Cape in South Africa?' "'Well, I think so,' replied the young man, somewhat dubiously. "'But I wouldn't be certain about it, though the steamship company guarantee to land me at the Cape, wherever it is.' The girl laughed. "'You must have given it a great deal of thought,' she said, "'when you don't really know where you are going.' "'Oh, I have a better idea of direction than you give me credit for. "'I am not such a fool as I looked last night, you know. "'Then I belonged to Spink and Company, "'and was sublet by them to old Heckle. 
now i belong to myself and south africa that makes a world of difference you know i see it does replied miss linderham won't you sit down the girl herself sank into an armchair while stansford sat on a low table swinging one foot to and fro his wide-brimmed hat thrown back and gazed at the girl until she reddened more than ever neither spoke for some moments do you know said stansford at last that when i look at you south africa seems a long distance away i thought it was a long distance away said the girl without looking up yes but it's longer and more lonely when one looks at you by jove if i thought i couldn't do better i would be tempted to take that two thousand a year offer of yours and it wasn't an offer of mine cried the girl hastily perhaps the lady i was thinking of wouldn't have agreed to it even if i had spoken to her about it that is quite true still i think if she had seen me in this outfit she would have thought me worth the money you think you can make more than two thousand a year out in south africa you have become very hopeful all in a moment it seems to me that a man who thinks he can make two thousand a year is very foolish to let himself out at two guineas an evening do you know miss linderham that was just what i thought myself and i told the respectable spink so too i told him i had an offer of two thousand a year in his own line of business he said that no firm in london could afford the money why he cried waxing angry i could get a duke for that well i replied it is purely a matter of business with me i was offered two thousand pounds a year as ornamental man by a most charming young lady who has a studio in south kensington and who is herself when dressed up as an artist prettier than any picture that ever entered the royal academy that's what i told spink the girl looked up at him first with indignation in her eyes and then with a smile hovering above her pretty lips you said nothing of the sort she answered for you knew nothing about this studio at that time so you see i am not going to emulate your dishonesty by pretending not to know you are referring to me my dishonesty exclaimed the young man with protest in his voice i am the most honest straightforward person alive and i believe i would take your two thousand a year offer if i didn't think i could do better where in south africa no in south kensington i think that when the lady learns how useful i could be around a studio oh i could learn to wash brushes sweep out the room prepare canvases light the fire and how nicely i could hand around cups of tea when she had her at homes and exhibited her pictures when she realizes this and sees what a bargain she is getting i feel almost certain she will not make any terms at all the young man sprang from the table and the girl rose from her chair a look almost of alarm in her face he caught her by the arms what do you think miss linderham you know the lady don't you think she would refuse to have anything to do with a cad like billy heckle rich as he is and would prefer a humble hard-working farmer from the cape the girl did not answer his question are you going to break my arms as you threatened to do his wrists last night maggie he whispered in a low voice with an intense ring in it i am going to break nothing but my own heart if you refuse me the girl looked up at him with a smile i knew when you came in you weren't going to south africa dick was all she said and he taking advantage of her helplessness kissed her 
End of section 19. Section 20 of Revenge by Robert Barr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 20. Purification. Eugene Caspillier sat at one of the metal tables of the Café Egalité, allowing the water from the carafe to filter slowly through a lump of sugar and a perforated spoon into his glass of absinthe. It was not an expression of discontent that was to be seen on the face of Caspillier, but rather a fleeting shade of unhappiness which showed he was a man to whom the world was being unkind. On the opposite side of the little round table sat his friend and sympathizing companion, Henri Lacour. He sipped his absinthe slowly, as absinthe should be sipped and it was evident that he was deeply concerned with the problem that confronted his comrade. "'Why, in heaven's name, did you marry her? That surely was not necessary.' Eugene shrugged his shoulders. The shrug said plainly, "'Why, indeed? Ask me an easier one.' For some moments there was silence between the two. Absinthe is not a liquor to be drunk hastily, or even to be talked over too much in the drinking. Henri did not seem to expect any other reply than the expressive shrug, and each man consumed his beverage dreamily, while the absinthe, in return for this thoughtful consideration, spread over them its benign influence, gradually lifting from their minds all care and worry dispersing the mental clouds that hover over all men at times, thinning the fog until it disappeared, rather than rolling the vapor away, as the warm sun dissipates into invisibility the opaque morning mists, leaving nothing but clean air all round and a blue sky overhead. "'A man must live,' said Caspillier at last. And the profession of decadent poet is not a lucrative one. Of course there is underlying fame in the future, but then we must have our absinthe in the present. Why did I marry her, you ask? I was the victim of my environment. I must write poetry. To write poetry I must live. To live I must have money. To get money I was forced to marry. Valderem is one of the best pastry cooks in Paris. Is it my fault, then, that the Parisians have a greater love for pastry than for poetry? Am I to blame that her wares are more sought for at her shop than are mine at the booksellers? I would willingly have shared the income of the shop with her without the folly of marriage, but Valderem has strange barbaric notions which were not overturnable by civilized reason. Still, my action was not wholly mercenary, nor indeed mainly so. There was a rhythm about her name that pleased me. Then she is a Russian, and my country and hers were at that moment in each other's arms, so I proposed to Valderim that we follow the national example. But, alas, Henri, my friend, I find that even ten years' residence in Paris will not eliminate the savage from the nature of a Russian. In spite of the name that sounds like the soft flow of a rich mellow wine, my wife is little better than a barbarian. When I told her about Tenise, she acted like a madwoman, drove me into the streets. But why did you tell her about Tenise? Pourquoi? How I hate that word! Why, why, why? It dogs one's actions like a bloodhound, eternally yelping for a reason. It seems to me that all my life I have had to account to an inquiring why. I don't know why I told her. It did not appear to be a matter requiring any thought or consideration. I spoke merely because Tenise came into my mind at the moment. But after that, the deluge. 
I shudder when I think of it. Again, the why, said the poet's friend. Why not cease to think of conciliating your wife? Russians are unreasoning aborigines. Why not take up a life in a simple poetic way with Tenise and avoid the Rue de Rossi altogether? Caspillier sighed gently. Here fate struck him hard. Alas, my friend, it is impossible. Tenise is an artist's model, and those brutes of painters who get such prices for their daubs pay her so little each week that her wages would hardly keep me in food and drink. My paper, pens, and ink I can get at the cafés, but how am I to clothe myself? If Valderem would but make us a small allowance, we could be so happy. Valderem is Madame, as I have so often told her, and she owes me something for that. But she actually thinks that because a man is married, he should come dutifully home like a bourgeois grocer. She has no poetry, no sense of the needs of a literary man in her nature. Lacour sorrowfully admitted that the situation had its embarrassments. The first glass of absinthe did not show clearly how they were to be met, but the second brought bravery with it, and he nobly offered to Beard, the Russian lioness in her den, explained the view Paris took of her unjustifiable conduct, and, if possible, bring her to reason. Caspillier's emotion overcame him, and he wept silently, while his friend, in eloquent language, told how famous authors, whose names were France's proudest possession, had been forgiven by their wives from slight lapses from strict domesticity, and these instances, he said, he would recount to Madame Valderam, and so induce her to follow such illustrious examples. The two comrades embraced and separated, the friend to use his influence and powers of persuasion with Valderam, the husband to tell Tenise how blessed they were in having such a friend to intercede for them. For Tunis, bright little Parisienne that she was, bore no malice against the unreasonable wife of her lover. Henri Lacour paused opposite the pastry shop on the Rue de Rossi that bore the name of Valderem over the temptingly fitted windows. Madame Caspillier had not changed the title of her well-known shop when she gave up her own name. Lacour caught sight of her serving her customers, and he thought she looked more like a Russian princess than a shopkeeper. He wondered now at the preference of his friend for the petite black-haired model. Valderem did not seem more than twenty. She was large and strikingly handsome with abundant auburn hair that was almost red. Her beautifully molded chin denoted perhaps too much firmness, and was in striking contrast to the weakness of her husband's lower face. Lacour almost trembled as she seemed to flash one look directly at him, and, for a moment, he feared she had seen him loitering before the window. Her eyes were large, of a limpid amber color, but deep within them smoldered a fire that Lacour felt he would not care to see blaze up. His task now wore a different aspect from what it had worn in front of the Café Egalité. Hesitating a moment, he passed the shop, and stopping at a neighboring café, ordered another glass of absinthe. It is astonishing how rapidly the genial influence of this stimulant departs. Fortified once again, he resolved to act before his courage had time to evaporate, and so, goading himself on with the thought that no man should be afraid to meet any woman, be she Russian or civilized, he entered the shop, making his most polite bow to Madame Caspillier. "'I have come, madame,' he began, as the friend of your husband, to talk with you regarding his affairs. "'Ah!' said Valderem, 
and Henri saw with dismay the fires deep down in her eyes rekindle. But she merely gave some instructions to assistant, and turning to Lacour, asked him to be so good as to follow her. She led him through the shop and up a stair at the back, drawing open a door on the first floor. Lacour entered a neat drawing room with windows opening out upon the street. Madame Caspillier seated herself at a table, resting her elbow upon it, shading her eyes with her hand, and yet Lacour felt them searching his very soul. "'Sit down,' she said. "'You are my husband's friend. What do you have to say?' Now it is a difficult thing for a man to tell a beautiful woman that her husband, for the moment, prefers someone else, so Lacour began on generalities. He said a poet might be likened to a butterfly, or perhaps to the more industrious bee who sipped honey from every flower and so enriched the world. A poet was a law unto himself and should not be judged harshly from what might be termed a shopkeeping point of view. Then Lacour, warming to his work, gave many instances where the wives of great men had condoned and even encouraged their husbands' little idiosyncrasies, to the great augmenting of our most valued literature. Now and then, as this eloquent man talked, Valderam's eyes seemed to flame dangerously in the shadow, but the woman neither moved nor interrupted him while he spoke. When he had finished, her voice sounded cold and unimpassioned, and he felt with relief that the outbreak he had feared was at least postponed. "'You would advise me, then,' she began, "'to do as the wife of that great novelist did,' and invite my husband and the woman he admires to my table? "'Oh, I don't say I could ask you to go so far as that,' said Lacour. "'But—' "'I'm no halfway woman. It is all or nothing with me. If I invited my husband to dine with me, I would also invite this creature—what is her name? Tenise, you say? Well, I would invite her, too.' Does she know he is a married man? Yes, cried Lacour eagerly, but I assure you, madam, she has nothing but the kindliest feelings towards you. There is no jealousy about Tenise. How good of her, how very good of her, said the Russian woman, with such bitterness that Lacour fancied uneasily that he had somehow made an injudicious remark whereas all his efforts were concentrated in a desire to conciliate and please. "'Very well,' said Valderem, rising. "'You may tell my husband that you have been successful in your mission. Tell him that I will provide for them both. Ask them to honor me with their presence at breakfast tomorrow morning at twelve o'clock. If he wants money, as you say, here are two hundred francs.' which will probably be sufficient for his wants until midday tomorrow. Lacour thanked her with a profuse graciousness that would have delighted any ordinary giver, but Valderem stood impassive like a tragedy queen, and seemed only anxious that he should speedily take his departure now that his errand was done. The heart of the poet was filled with joy when he heard from his friend that at last Valderem had come to regard his union with Tenise in the light of reason. Caspillier, as he embraced Lacour, admitted that perhaps there was something to be said for his wife after all. The poet dressed himself with more than usual care on the day of the feast, and Tenise, who accompanied him, put on some of the finery that had been bought with Valderem's donation. She confessed that she thought Eugene's wife had acted with consideration towards them, but maintained that she did not wish to meet her, for, judging from Caspillier's account, 
his wife must be a somewhat formidable and terrifying person still she went with him she said solely through good nature and a desire to heal family differences tenise would do anything in the cause of domestic peace the shop assistant told the pair when they had dismissed the cab that madame was waiting for them upstairs in the drawing-room valderem was standing with her back to the window like a low-browed goddess her tawny hair loose over her shoulders and the pallor of her face made more conspicuous by her costume of unrelieved black caspillier with the grace characteristic of him swept off his hat and made a low deferential bow but when he straightened himself up and began to say the complimentary things and poetical phrases he had put together for the occasion at the cafe the night before the lurid look of the russian made his tongue falter and tenise who had never seen a woman of this sort before laughed a nervous half-frightened little laugh and clung closer to her lover than before the wife was even more forbidding than she had imagined valderem shuddered slightly when she saw this intimate movement on the part of her rival and her hand clenched and unclenched convulsively come she said cutting short her husband's halting harangue and sweeping past them drawing her skirts aside on nearing tenise she led the way up to the dining-room a floor higher i'm afraid of her whimpered tenise holding back she will poison us nonsense said caspillier in a whisper come along she is too fond of me to attempt anything of that kind and you are safe when i am here valderem sat at the head of the table with her husband at her right hand and tenise on her left the breakfast was the best either of them had ever tasted the hostess sat silent but no second talker was needed when the poet was present tenise laughed merrily now and then at his bright sayings for the excellence of the meal had banished her fears of poison what penetrating smell is that that fills the room better open the window said caspillier it is nothing replied valderem speaking for the first time since they had sat down it is only naphtha i have had this room cleaned with it the window won't open and if it would we would not hear you talk with the noise from the street the poet would suffer anything rather than have his eloquence interfered with so he said no more about the fumes of naphtha when the coffee was brought in valderem dismissed the trim little maid who had waited on them i have some of your favorite cigarettes here i will get them she arose and as she went to the table on which the boxes lay she quietly and deftly locked the door and pulling out the key slipped it into her pocket do you smoke mademoiselle she asked speaking to tenise she had not recognized her presence before sometimes madame answered the girl with a titter you will find these cigarettes excellent my husband's taste in cigarettes is better than in many things he prefers the russian to the french caspillier laughed loudly that's a slap at you tenise he said at me not so she speaks of cigarettes and i myself prefer the russian only they are so expensive a look of strange eagerness came into valderem's expressive face softened by a touch of supplication her eyes were on her husband but she said rapidly to the girl stop a moment mademoiselle do not light your cigarette until i give the word then to her husband she spoke beseechingly in russian 
a language she had taught him in the early months of their marriage. Eugenio, Eugenio, don't you see the girl's a fool? How can you care for her? She would be as happy with the first man she met in the street. I, I think only of you. Come back to me, Eugenio. She leaned over the table towards him, and in her vehemence clasped his wrist. The girl watched them both with a smile. It reminded her of a scene in an opera she had heard once in a strange language. The prima donna had looked and pleaded like Valderem. Caspillier shrugged his shoulders, but did not withdraw his wrist from her firm grasp. "'Why go over the whole weary ground again?' he said. "'If it were not to Nice, it would be somebody else. I was never meant for a constant husband, Val. I understood from Lacour that we were to have no more of this nonsense.' She slowly relaxed hold on his unresisting wrist. The old, hard, tragic look came into her face as she drew a deep breath. The fire in the depths of her amber eyes rekindled as the softness went out of them. "'You may light your cigarette now, mademoiselle,' she said almost in a whisper to Tenise. "'I swear I could light mine in your eyes, Val,' cried her husband. "'You would make a name for yourself on the stage. "'I will write a tragedy for you, and we will—' "'Tenny struck a match. "'A simultaneous flash of lightning and clap of thunder filled the room. "'The glass in the window fell clattering into the street. "'Valderem was standing with her back against the door.' Tenise, fluttering her helpless little hands before her, tottered shrieking to the open window. Caspillier, staggering, panting to his feet, gasped, "'You Russian devil! The key! The key!' He tried to clutch her throat, but she pushed him back. "'Go to your French woman. She's calling for help.' Tenise sank by the window, one burning arm over the sill, and was silent. Caspillier, mechanically beating back the fire from his shaking head, whimpering and sobbing, fell against the table and then went headlong on the floor. Valderem, a pillar of fire, swaying gently to and fro before the door, whispered in a voice of agony, oh eugene eugene and flung herself like a flaming angel or fiend on the prostrate form of the man end of section twenty end of revenge by robert varr recording by roger moline